My name is Eva Brito and I am the director of Bristol Community College's Women's Center. Welcome to another um, of our series, Stories That Inspire. It's an opportunity to learn from someone's story and hopefully get inspired as part of the Women's Center. Um, this actually is a partnership. Sometimes we partner with other um, programs and departments at the college, and this is a partnership with our Office of Disability Services. Um, and Julie is the director of our disability services. She's here, so I'm going to give her the floor before I go into sharing a little bit about the Women's Center. So welcome, Julie, and everyone on the call. <laughs> Thank you, Eva. I'm Julie. I'm the Director of Disability Services, and I was really happy to be able to uh, co-sponsor today's talk. Um, thank you for, for bringing an opportunity for everyone to just, just listen to different experiences and grow in our own awareness of um, our personal experiences and how that, that just helps us become more empathic to working with all of our students and our peers. So thank you, and I, I can't wait to hear your entire story. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Um, I will start off by sharing a little bit about the Women's Center and then we'll go into our program. So I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Maybe because I'm doing, that's interesting. Okay, <laughs> you never know with Zoom what's gonna happen, <laughs> the beauty of technology. So um, what you see before you is our center. If we were not in this pandemic, we would be, our host, um, our speaker would be on that green couch and we would be in that setting. That's actually on our Fall River campus at E104. It's a beautiful space for a lot of resources. We have a professional closet that we have all gender clothing, a lactation room, a lending library, and a lot of great things that we hope to um, have students utilize in the future. But here you also have the mission of the Women's Center, so I'm gonna share that with you. The mission of the Women's Center at Bristol Community College is to provide a safe and supportive space of empowerment through advocacy and education. The Women's Center promotes the concept of intersectionality that gender intersects with all other markers of identity and thus works to help students understand the complexity of their lives and the lives of others. Um, and we do that in various ways. We provide different resources to uh, things within the college as, out, as well as outside of the college. We provide ed educational programs and really a space where students can feel safe and supported and welcomed or inclusive of all cultures, all genders, and um, we do that in many different ways, including what you have here today, which is Stories That Inspire series, an opportunity to hear from someone's story. There's so many amazing women out in our world and that have different stories and there's power in a story. So um, this is an opportunity to uh, have a story um, be heard. And I'll also share with you some of the other things that we have here at the center and how we go about that. One of the things we're doing um, this semester is Women Writing History Project. That project actually um, started with the National Women's History Museum. They have this project and we figured we could do the same here at Bristow. We know that the pandemic has impacted everyone in this room and everyone in this world, but more so women have disproportionately been impacted by the pandemic. Women make um, over than uh, 50, over than 60%, close 70% of essential workers are women um, due to you know, children having to stay at home, the domestic duties and not having childcare. Women have been impacted in different ways. Um, and we wanted to make sure that women's voices were heard and captured in this historic time. So the Women Writing History Project is an opportunity for anyone at Bristol to share. They can share journal writing about how they've been impacted. They can share a drawing, their monologue, um, you know, whatever they feel an expressive outlet for that. And if you don't identify as a woman, if you identify as a male, you can talk about your wife or your daughter or your sister or someone and to really make sure that women's voices are heard and showing how women have been his, um, heroic during this time. So this project is happening now that you can get the information and we'll put that in the chat. 
In addition, um, April 27th, we're gonna have a presentation that we're gonna share some of those journal entries and some of the stories that we hear. So that's an exciting story that we wanted you to let you know about. In addition, uh, Parenting Advancement Pathways was also launched this month as part of Women's History Month. This is a program to help parenting students. We know that it can be challenging to go to school and be a parent at any point um, as a college student, but more so now with the pandemic and individuals feeling isolated and not really having the support. So this program is specifically designed to help parenting students with wraparound um, supports within the college as well as outside of the college. It's a cohort model. We have a first cohort of 13 women. They get a mentor and a lot of different unique supports to ensure that they will be successful for graduation. So if you are a parenting student or no one at the college, you should definitely have them reach out to us and we can let them know more about the parenting advancement pathways. And because I always forget at the end, I'm going to do it now. Um, this is a series that happens every month. This is our next speaker for next month, Dr. Bridget Arrows. And she is a counselor here within our um, mental health, uh, counselor within our mental health department here and a psychologist. And she's going to be speaking about her story and her neighbor, Native American history and roots. So this is going to be part of the story. Um, so that is about the end of my sharing. So I will stop that. So you have a little understanding of what the Women's Center does and resources. I do see Rob, um, you have your hand up. Um, hello. hello. Oh, I can't get it. I'm on my phone. My laptop died. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure I wasn't ignoring you. I'm like, do you have if something? I have a question. Thank you. All set. Okay. Hi, Rosalind, everybody. Hi, Rob. <laughs> I thought he was going to start to heckle me. <laughs> no, no, no. I'll save that for mid-presentation as usual. Okay, perfect. So um, our guest speaker today, we actually met a few years back at a women's conference. We both wrote a book and we had tables right next to each other at the RISE Women's Leadership Conference. And I just thought she had an amazing story, Rosanna. And um, I never forgot that and her warm spirit that day. And now um, the pandemic has not separated us. She's here today. So I don't like to give a big intro because this is your time to shine. So if everyone would welcome Rosanna and she can share her story. Great, thank you. Let me share my screen real quick. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, I. so I want to thank you, uh, Eva, for having me. and. Uh, when I got your email and call, I was like, oh, and I remembered your name and could picture you right from the beginning. So uh, thank you so much for having me. And I feel as though that during this time, it's probably more important than ever to keep these types of things going so that people feel like they're being connected, even though we are still remote so much these days. Um, so thank you. Thank you to Bristol Community College for having me. And and um, the disabilities departments for um, having me as well. So thank you. Uh, over the next few minutes, I'm going to go through my story and who I was, what happened to me, why I'm here speaking today. And then we can do some questions and answers. And I'm gonna try to keep it as uh, conversational as possible, although I'm not the best with it being on a Zoom. If we were all in the room together, I would be asking different questions throughout the presentation. So, uh, you know, I think maybe what I'll do is go through it and then kind of, if you feel like you have a question to ask, I'll direct them at the end of kind of my story, I guess is probably the easiest way to do it now that I'm thinking about it. Um, so once again, thank you for, uh, for being here and for listening to my journey, I guess. And uh, as we go through, actually, let me just, uh, you know what, I don't know if I have. Uh, so for some, oh, here we go. For some reason, it's not allowing me to use my, there we go. Um, so, uh, if you do want to ask a question, if you're not familiar, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you will see uh, a chat section. And if you put your questions in there at the end, I'll go through the chat section and look for questions or raise your hand. And then that'll notify me that you have a question in there. So, 
I'll go through that. And if there's some questions that either you don't want to answer or uh, you think about after the fact or just want to reach out, feel free to uh, email me at Roseanne at robostrong.com. Uh, that's robostrong, which Ro is for Roseanne, Bo is for Boston, and Boston Strong. So robostrong.com. Uh, so, and I'm an open book. I will answer anything, whether it's via chat, in person, through an email. Uh, there's nothing that I won't answer, and um, I feel comfortable doing so. So, uh, it's a unique story that I have to share, and uh, whatever I can do to pay it forward is is what I love to do. So. Without any further, I'm going to go into my story. And my story and my journey really starts from my hometown of Drake, Massachusetts. Now, uh, I'm not sure if people know where Drake it is. I can tell you that uh, over the course of doing these presentations, not many know. And even growing up there, I've learned that not many know where it was. Uh, when I was in the second grade, my family, we were living in the city of Lowell, Mass, and told my sister and I that we were moving to this place, Drake at Mass, and I kind of thought we were moving to California. So uh, little did I know, Lowell and Drake it are right next door to each other. So I was really disappointed in the second grade, knowing that I wasn't going that far uh, from my original home. But I grew up in Drake it, and uh, I like to show... Uh, this photo as this is sort of the house I grew up in. When we first moved into the house, it was just the right side that you're looking at um, uh, from the windows to the right and uh, was back in the 70s. My, it's my, my parents and my sister and I were moving there. And over the course of time, we built on the addition to the house with the garage. Uh, I would say, you know, typical middle class family. My father was a school teacher. My mom worked during tax season at the IRS. And then my sister and I just, you know, like any other child going to school. Uh, in this town of Drake, it, in this neighborhood, it was very rural. It uh, was a new development. Right down the street was a farm early on. And uh, quite often, the cows and pigs would get loose and run through our yard. Um, right behind us was another farm and I won't lie, uh, we did try to go cow tipping back there. We would sneak onto the property and uh, try to come upon a cow, but they always got scared away. So I have no idea that if you, uh, that if they're sleeping, you can tip them over. I can't prove that, but that's kind of the, the childhood that I grew up in. and. Here's a picture of, <laughs> of us, uh, the four of us, uh, early on. I would say this picture is probably when I was five or six and my sister's just 14 months older. So she was probably six or seven, maybe in this, in this photo. Uh, when I was 17, my parents had told my sister and I that they were getting divorced or separated at first and then divorced. And at that time, it wasn't a surprise to me because I knew that uh, they would be better off with other people. As a child, I think you're, you have a good perception of different things in your family life. And it wasn't a bad scenario, but you knew that, um, you know, it would probably be better off in, in that situation. And I have to say that both of my parents have been with respective others now for 30 plus years that are so much more appropriate for each other. And they're just wonderful people that they're with as well. So, you know, it was kind of, I would say, a typical childhood. I mean, there's a lot of divorces that go on these days. And this was really kind of, um, you know, it was unheard of of that time, but I think it was the beginning of all of that and, uh, you know, somewhat acceptable and kind of normal, I think, or going into a norm, unfortunately, back then. But, uh, you know, at 17 years old, it's a little bit easier to understand what's going on with your parents and, uh, and you know, more acceptable at that point in time. Now, uh, I... I will say from an early age, whether it was when my parents were together or after being divorced, that both of them realized that I was a highly sociable person. I won't say that I was ever the best student. I feel as though that uh, 
I was more sociable than wanting to do schoolwork. So I was the first, even though my sister was older, I wanted to go to the local Pup Warner dances. My sister could care less. She was more studious and would rather be reading a book. So, you know, going into the fact of uh, asking my parents to go to the school dance before my sister would have done something like that, it was definitely a no. But I think that was probably the first sign. And then the second sign was that I had a lot of friends that were cheerleaders. So I did go and try out for the Pup Warner cheerleading team. And I will tell you that I did not make it. I was not coordinated enough to do so. Uh, but it was fun to have those friends because I still did get invited to the dances and eventually did get to go once I got into junior high. Now, knowing that I was sociable uh, and knowing my personality, for me, myself, I knew I wanted to go away to college. I wanted to use college as a stepping stone to move out of this town of Drake it. Uh, I had gotten the taste of going into Boston and enjoying the North End and Faneuil Hall and, uh, you know, kind of the city life. And uh, I thought that maybe college would help me be that stepping stone to move on. Now, again, my parents knowing much better than I did that uh, they would need to keep tabs of me. So I ended up going right back to Lowell, to the University of Massachusetts, Lowell. And I have to say that it was an amazing experience. And a lot of my best friends are from the University of Lowell, uh, University of Massachusetts, Lowell, where I've definitely made lifelong relationships. And I also think that uh, in the process, I did join a sorority there. And I think that gave me uh, the confidence to have a voice, even though I don't think if you had asked me back then if I would ever get into public speaking, I would have been, my answer would have been hell no. So uh, even though it gave me some confidence back then and to really want to pursue a corporate career and kind of move through the chain of command over the course of time, I, my roots really started at that home in Drake it with the support of my parents through going to the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Now, uh, over the course of time growing up as well in Drake it, and like I mentioned, going into the city of Lowell, we would off, uh, going into the city of Boston, we would often go into the marathon. Uh, my dad had gotten into running when we were little and uh, going into the marathon was kind of a big deal. Uh, you know, looking back and not really realizing the excitement for me at that time was that, you know, it's always held the third Monday in April marking the anniversary of the, Amer the American Revolution, um, the anniversary of the American Revolutionary War, which started right outside of Boston. And I didn't realize that's kind of why our April vacations was April vacation. It was the beginning of it, uh, Patriots Day. And in my mind, growing up, it was always Marathon Monday. So going in with my dad, we had a neighbor next door in that house in Drake it who would run the marathon every year. So we would go into the Red Sox game first. And way back then, the end of the Red Sox game was kind of the beginning of when the regular runners would come into the city, although that's since changed. Um, but I also got caught up in you know, the atmosphere, the social atmosphere, the excitement, the wave of the energy of the mm -hmm. million spectators that come into Boston, basically the week before, kind of coming into the city and checking it out. And uh, the, the runners that come from all over the world, it's the most historic marathon in the world, uh, anywhere from 25,000 to 30,000 runners. Um, on top of the million spectators converge on the city. And it's just a, it's a great time. It also marks for me the beginning of spring, which uh, I am not a fan of winter. I never was, although I do like to, I did like to ski, uh, but I would rather live in warmer weather and drive to it than live in it as we do here in New England. But I guess we make our choices to live where we live. And um, here I am dealing with again, uh, uh, you know, this day was a lot of fun going with my family. And over the course of years, it changed into a tradition to going with friends as well. Now, I mentioned that my dad was a runner, uh, you know, he, way back when the running craze started, I would never forget that he would run in place, if, like in our 
living room for like 20 minutes or 30 minutes. And uh, it was just kind of funny to see. And I, I won't, I won't lie. We did mock him. And I am personally, I wouldn't consider myself a runner, but I did personally get into doing uh, local road races, 5Ks, 10Ks. In 2011, um, I did the, the Falmouth Road Race, which is seven miles. And I really did this for a few reasons. Not because I liked running. I, it's always been a love-hate relationship. But uh, the first reason was that uh, I, since 18 years old, had belonged to a gym. I was always concerned about weight and trying to keep my weight down and staying active. And, uh, you know, I would do Zoom classes or aerobic classes and, I, you know, but you had to rely on gym hours. You had to rely on class schedules and your school or work schedules. And in my mind, um, going, you know, to run was throwing on a pair of sneakers at any time, wherever you were. And so that became a little bit more flexible for me to do. Uh, and then I had a bunch of friends that were really runners who have done multiple marathons and different road races. And they're the ones that got me into doing this running. So in my mind that I could exercise on my time and on the social aspect, even though it's a, more of an individual sport, we would find the road races that would have the social activities afterwards. So uh, they had gotten me involved in doing a, a road race that in the summertime, it's a series uh, Thursday evenings, once a month from like May until October. And it's called Let's Run and Have Some Fun. At the end of that, there's a band, beer, barbecue, and, you know, a good time hanging out with my, with my friends at that point. So, you know, it was kind of a win-win situation for me to get into running, but the more I did it, the more free I felt between kind of going on my own time free and just being out side free, especially after a winter, and uh, then being able to have a good time afterwards and enjoy and really not feel having that bear or um, uh, having that barbecue food. So, um, you know, it was something for me that really was doable. Um, so with that, I did do road races and coincidentally on Sunday, April 14th, 2013, I had convinced three of my girlfriends to do um, a 5K. It was the Boston Athletic Association 5K it's held every year right before the marathon. This particular year, it was the Sunday before. And it was something that I kind of always wanted to do. It wasn't that, um, it, it was, I think it was because of the energy that was in the city, the meaning behind doing this 5K because the marathon was the next day. I don't know if I really ever thought I would run the marathon. I would say the day that I would be in there watching and cheering other people on, you do get caught up in that momentum. And in the back of my mind, I would think, okay, maybe next year I'll do it. Maybe next year I'll do it. Maybe next year I'll do it. And every year I would wake up on Tuesday morning and go, what was I thinking yesterday? So this particular year, I thought I really kind of started running a lot, doing that marathon, doing that um, Falmouth Road Race and some other longer ones. And uh, I thought that if I ran this 5K, the finish line was the iconic Boston Marathon finish line, that maybe I would be able to convince one of these three women to do the marathon with me the following year. Now, coincidentally, uh, my friend to my left, my, uh, my friend Sabrina, she had decided with me that she would do it. So in 2014, uh, my other two friends, it was the first time that they ever ran a 5K. Uh, and they loved it so much, they have never run a 5K again. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'm lucky that they're still talking to me because um, all sarcasm aside, they hated it. But they did finish it. And we were so excited that they did this accomplishment. And we spent the afternoon celebrating in the back bay, having brunch, going around shopping and just enjoying the, the spring weather, the energetic atmosphere and just our friendship. Now, Knowing, the, knowing that the next day was Marathon Monday, uh, we said our goodbyes because we knew we would see each other the following day as we had over the course of I don't know how many years. And it was kind of the thing to do uh, to, to 
be off on that Monday, especially with the marathon being in the city and the local towns surrounding the city that, you know, a lot of businesses, whether state or federal or even individually owned, would close uh, because it would be hard to get to work or from work. And, and um, a lot of people wanted to uh, participate in the marathon. So, uh, you know, it had been years. I don't recall one that I've missed uh, before this and, um, and even now so. And, uh, you know, it was just something to do in, in our age group and our group of friends. And even if you weren't really that friendly with people, acquaintances, you knew that you would um, go in on Monday, you would see the same people, you would get to see people that maybe you hadn't seen since the year before. So it was definitely a day I always looked forward to. And over the course of graduating from the University of Massachusetts Lowell, I had lived in California for a couple of years and I moved back to Boston. I had moved down to Florida for a few months and moved back to Boston. And any time that I was out of the state of Massachusetts, I always made sure one way or another, I was home for Marathon Monday. So it wasn't unlike me to be there that day. And we all knew that we would see each other the next morning started off like it had many, many years in the past, uh, going to the Red Sox game. This picture is the last picture I took that Monday, April 15, 2013. Uh, my friend Sabrina and I had amazing seats. We were like five rows behind home plate. And this picture really doesn't do it justice because it was a beautiful spring morning. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have ever been into the marathon or ever been into the Red Sox game, on this particular day, but it's just one to feel free, to feel excited spring was on the way and just the energy is always and has been so truly amazing. So we were here uh, enjoying the game and over the course of years, we didn't always have friends that ran it, but more than not, we did have at least one that would be running the marathon. So this particular day we had a couple friends that were running it and one of them uh our friend jen she's a pretty fast runner and i'm gosh at this point in time i'm not sure how many marathons she's done but probably close to 10. we got a text alert in the seventh inning that she would be making her way into the city so we knew we would need to walk from fenway park over to boylston street to be at our usual spot that we would go to that our friends would know to look for us as they were making their way towards the finish line now, in the next photo that I'm going to show you, when after leaving here, we made our way over and um, we made our way to Boylston Street. We would always meet at Forum, even before Forum, uh, it was called Vox and we were, we'd go to Vox. And so this was just the place where we would meet and our friends would know that when they were getting close to Boylston Street to look for us along that metal barricade that separated us from the spectators and the runners. Uh, Sabrina and I had been there for about 20 minutes when we got another automated alert update that Jen was now going to, she was just coming into Kenmore Square. And so we figured within the next 15 minutes or so, she would be coming down Boylston towards the finish line. And we didn't want to miss her. So we stepped out to that barricade. And um, I'm not sure if you can see, um, Eva, can you see my, can you see the cursor? The pointer yes. on there? Yeah. Okay. okay, great. So um, this is my friend Sabrina here. We both started on the side of the mailbox. Now, uh, I consider myself vertically challenged as I am 5'1", and I have a hard time seeing over a lot of people. So somehow I, well, I tried to see over this mailbox and that was not happening, even if I stood on my tippy toes. So I found my way, um, a little path over to this spot where I'm standing. And, you know, I put this picture in here because it's just so shocking to see how close everybody is. And, um, you know, there was a point in time that my friend Megan here actually even asked to come and sneak in between myself and this gentleman so that we could see Jen come down the road together. And basically he said no, because he was waiting for his wife and he needed to watch for her. So Megan went back to the other side. Now, had a lot of people do ask the question, you know, did you see him? Did you notice him? And the answer is absolutely not. I mean, my focus was on watching the runners. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. I'm not sure if I'm like looking over to Megan, uh, most likely 
maybe talking to this guy because I will talk to anybody. Uh, and so just kind of watching and looking around, but not looking behind me in any aspect. And as you can see the circle, there is the bag that he dropped right at the base of the tree. So, you know, kind of stepping out here, watching, cheering. It was a typical day and a typical day with people having backpacks. You can see this gentleman here has a backpack on his back. Uh, so, you know, nothing unusual of it being uh, gonna be a bad day. So, uh, you know, in this picture, I had no idea. Megan had come over, as I mentioned, and then she went back to the other side of the mailbox. And it was probably within a couple minutes of that time frame that Megan, of her going back over there, that the first explosion had happened down to our left in the photo. Uh, and, you know, being there so many years in advance, knowing the routine, never in my mind had I ever imagined that it would have been a bomb. People were saying the building had fallen. Uh, you know, different thoughts go through your head. And it was only 10 to 12 seconds of the first one and the second one going off. And, uh, you know, I had no idea, but so many things were going through and your brain works so fast that in my head, I said, you know what, I'm going to turn to my right and run because I knew I, you know, it wouldn't be a good situation if I went over this uh, railing. So I ran to my right and basically ran right into that bag. Uh, I saw two flashes of white light and then everything really went blank. Uh, could have been in my mind at that point in time, could have been five minutes, could have been longer, could have been shorter. And watching videos, I know that it was only a matter of seconds. But as it went blank, and then coming to, those are really the reasons why, you know, what happened thereafter, the reasons why I am here talking about my experience. Uh, you know, it was a crazy, crazy experience. And I think that, you know, people ask or people say to me, you know, I, would, I wouldn't know how to respond in that situation, or I wouldn't be able to do what you did or that type of thing. And the, the crazy thing is none of us know how we're going to react when we're in those moments. I'm a big baby. I pass out at the mention of an IV. I don't even need to see it or have it stuck in me. Um, it's, you know, not a good situation. And what I saw, luckily it was minimal around me, made me realize it was a bad, bad scenario and that I needed to do what I could to keep myself alive. I knew that I had to bring uh, those lessons that I learned, the, inner, the inner, inner, inner lessons that I learned growing up in that house in Drake it, the life lessons of like never panic in case of an emergency. You need to stay calm. You know this. This situation is bad, and if you go, if you get hysterical and get involved in the chaos, and let it take you over, you may not survive this. And you know, somehow these thoughts came to my mind, and I was very fortunate that I did take those those take that thought process because, uh, you know, I don't think I would have lived, and I think that I did all that I could to keep myself alive. I had first responders, civilian first responders, firefighter first responders, police first responders, medical first responders, all come upon helping me and helping me uh, get through these crazy, crazy moments. And they got me to the hospital. And I'm forever thankful to them in this scenario of keeping me alive. And also the doctors that kept me alive once they, once they got me to the hospital. I was fortunate enough to get to Mass General and um, uh, I, I, my primary care is there. I had one of the best trauma doctors that there is in the, I would say in my biased opinion um, in the world, but he took one look at me and he knew that it was a bomb blast. Dr. King uh, um, is, uh, He's done many, many amputations over in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, he is um, in the army and he does a lot, he's seen a lot of these injuries. So as soon as he saw me in the emergency room, he knew what he needed to do. I was not coherent at that point. When I got there, I had, um, you know, let myself go knowing that I did what I could. And, uh, you know, it was really about choices 
right from the beginning of the moment of that chaos, the choice to do what I could to stay alive. And then after I came out of the sedated coma that they had me in for 20, uh, almost 24 hours to really um, focus on this recovery in a positive way. And I think that life is really all about choices and it's really made me understand that more. And also, it's also about risks. Uh, you know, I think we all take a risk every day going out our front door and even more so now with COVID and, you know, cause you take a risk of going out your front door and going to the grocery store if you have to, or, you know, going to the doctors if you have to. And you have to think of what way outweighs those risks. You know, is it the rewards? Is it, you know, hopefully it's the benefits of, of that risk that you're taking. And I knew that I had a lot of risks to face in this scenario. And a lot of it was to relive life. Uh, I, I will never say I was unfortunate. I'll never say what if. I always say how lucky I was because in, in all honesty, I am lucky of where I was positioned when that bomb went off. I could have been more gravely injured as a lot of people around me were. Um, I consider myself one of the less uh, injured people, even though I lost my right leg. This picture is actually at this point in time, three days later, after three amputations on my right leg later, where they started below the knee and had to work their way up to clean out the wounds. And Dr. King came in and told me that they had amputated my leg. And at that point, you know, my comment to him, it, it, it was, it is what it is, which I find funny because when I was working um, at a corporate company called National Development, I was overseeing their residential portfolio. And I had different people in certain circumstances say to me, it is what it is and want to move on. And a lot of times it's not always what it is, what it is. We have choices. There's things we can try. There's options we can do. But in this particular moment, it wasn't, it is what it is. It was, my leg was gone and I had to live with it. So uh, I, I basically said that is, it is what it is. My leg's not gonna grow back and I need to move forward. And the way for me to move forward was to stay positive. Uh, you know, and the other part of it is to really find the humor in these down moments. So, you know, uh, my, humor started right at the beginning because people came in and were telling me how good I looked, how good I looked. And I know I didn't. So one of my childhood friends that I grew up near in that house in Drake, it came in and I knew he would tell me the truth. So when my friend, John Abbott came in and I said, John, how do I really look? He looked at me and he goes, you look like S H I T. <laughs> and I was <laughs> like, Oh my God. I'm like, I knew it. I'm like, I knew you would tell me the truth. And, um, you know, I, no one gave me a mirror for some particular reason. And my hair was like fried up and, you know, I had a look like I had a microderm abrasion to the face. And, but I knew down deep that I could move past this. And I knew that those injuries would heal. And I set small goals for myself. And it was really based on each time one of my injuries healed, that was a positive move in the right direction. Um, and, you know, another part of the thing was I asked, I had heard rumors that I was going to, I was going to have a visitor, and um, and so I said, you know, should I put my hat on, put a hat on for this visitor, or should I just let my hair, my fried hair, be as is? And they said, oh no, you should definitely put a hat on because we, um, President Obama came to visit. Now, this is not a political statement whatsoever. Like them, hate them, how whatever it is. Um, I think the point is that I found humor in the moment because I really don't remember a lot of the conversation that I had with him. What I do remember is when he leaned down to talk to me, uh, basically all I could think of is he has amazing skin. Um, and that was like the one thing I personally took away from it. The other part was my mom and, uh, I've since written a book and if any of you have read it, Perfect Strangers, um, know that my mom can be a very strong person, uh, you know, especially after the divorce, she started kind of a, a female wallpapering design thing and then she went on to do other things and um, she's a strong force, crazy, but a strong force. And I'll never forget what I do remember is her as President Obama coming in and her getting his ear and going, they should never have to pay taxes again. They should never have to pay health insurance again. And they should all be able to throw out the first pitch at a Red Sox game. And he turned to her and he said, um, I don't know if you know this, but I'm a White Sox fan and I will see what I can do. Uh, so it was kind of humorous to hear that banter and then know how crazy my mom was and be slightly embarrassed that she was kind of 
you know, going at them with these requests. So uh, that's why I have it here. And honestly, I pay taxes and I pay health insurance. So, um, but you know, it was this group of support, my family, my sister, my three nieces, my brother-in-law, and even the nursing staff, the doctors, my dad, um, all of my family, my aunts, my uncles that came and really supported were people that I really relied on. And these visits of strangers were very important to me as well. Now, in this situation, you never know what's gonna happen. And, uh, you know, you gotta make the good out of the bad and out of this whole entire crazy thing of losing my leg and being helped off the street and to the hospital by, uh, my, by first responders, as I mentioned, civilian or otherwise, um, I ended up meeting my now husband who is firefighter Mike Materia, who at the time and is still is uh, at the Boylston Street house um, in Boston in the Back Bay. And his house came and really uh, helped prepare me to be loaded and transported to the hospital and really the, you know, equally part of the reason why I'm still alive today. And even so with that are the people that have come in my life since then, whether it be the first responders, the civilians, the doctors, the um, therapists, physical, orthopedic or otherwise, a lot of the first, the other survivors uh, become family. Uh, I have, now have learned to rely on people where I was a headstrong individual, um, you know, probably a control freak to some extent, which a lot of us are, um, had to prove that I was going to make it in the corporate world and do things for myself and, you know, enjoy life and all of that. I really had to learn to rely on family, on friends, and new family that is not blood related, such as these first resp um, the first responders, the other survivors, and the organizations that came to step up to help us, such as the Semper Fi Fund, Challenge Athletes Foundation, they have become so important and pivotal in my life, allowing me to take these challenges and these risks and be supportive or be there doing the same. Going out of your comfort zone together has been so um, encouraging and inspiring to me that, you know, I've tried skiing again and I hate it. I've tried snowboarding and I love it but I don't like the snow. So, you know, you got to figure out where you are in life and, and take these chances and try them and, you know, allow those that are around you that support you to do it. My company at the time, um, I was working for National, as I mentioned, and they were so supportive, letting me go off and do the things that I really wanted to try to do and let me make the decision of how my life was supposed to go. Uh, about a year after going back to work for six months in 2014, I decided to make the change and go into public speaking and tell my story because it is a unique story in, in how things have rolled out and the people that I've come to meet in life and, you know, share these experiences with. These are people that I would never, ever have met in my life before. Um, you know, my physical therapist, my occupational therapist photoed here in the Roseanne Strong t-shirts and then Shore Salter, who was a college student at the time, 19 years old, came in to help and assist. And then Shana uh, Catone, who's Boston police officer, and Mike Materia, as I you know, told you about him, they all made the choice to you know, run in and do these jobs on a regular day and then run in when there's tragedy. And you know, they know the risks, but they also know the rewards. And this definitely was a rewarding day. And since then, for me, it's been a rewarding life having all of them there. Even more so, uh, I've gotten into peer mentoring and meeting with other amputees or those that have had, you know, situations that have happened in their lives. And, you know, there are not a lot of female amputees out there. And uh, this one woman I went to visit, the first thing walking in, she said to me, oh my God, I'll be able to wear boots and skinny jeans again. And you don't think about the effects of having such a visual, physical change to your body until you're in that situation. And that was one thing too, that a lot of the groups that came to visit who were amputees, most of them men, but a few women of like, you know, what, what, what clothes can I wear? What shoes can I wear? Will I be able to go back to work again? I moved into the North end of Boston um, two years prior to this happening. And, you know, I 
lived on the second floor, 18 stairs to get to my apartment. Will I be able to go back to that life again? And, you know, do the errands walking around the city. And, and then for me to be able to pay it forward as those people showed me that I would be able to and pay it forward to other men, women, children, you know, it's truly been rewarding in so many ways. Um, and that's one thing that I've found that the people that were helping me, I was helping them by letting them help me. And now I'm helping these people, you know, get to that point as well. And it's been just amazing for me to be able to share that, um, you know, and again, a lot of it has come with making those choices of, of how to move forward in life and trying to keep a positive attitude. And not every day is rosy. I allow myself to have the emotions. I allow myself to cry. There are days that I don't want to put my leg on. And, you know, I force myself to, because that's the only way I'm going to get stuff done and live my life and move forward. And, you know, more importantly, humor and the humor that I have these days um, and the choices that I have, or, you know, I wake up in the morning and I say, Hmm, what leg am I going to put on, you know, and here I have these different legs, a walking leg, a dress up leg, a bike leg, a running leg, um, crutches. And, you know, I have so many jokes about every single one of them, but you know, uh, that's the humor I found in it. When I first got the running leg, cause I really wanted to get back to running immediately. Uh, I thought maybe putting the leopard print on the upper part would help me run faster, which I have discovered does not at all. Um, and even though people told me early on that it was still too early to start running, I did practice, I did accomplish a 5k, but I also realized that I can accomplish a 5k just walking. Um, I may put the running leg back on again sometime in the near future. I feel like I'm getting that craving to do so and I'm going to try it again and see where it goes. And that's, that's it. You got to keep trying to live your life, make these choices and try to just understand life is about choices. Life is about risks. It's about rewards. You know, is this a, is what it is situation or is there something that can be done to change my circumstances and how can I approach this to change them? And, you know, this journey of life from growing up in Drake, it going through all that I have up into this point was one life. And uh, one journey. And that journey has taken a different road than I've expected. But the one journey that it really is and that journey of life, it really, it's not a sprint, but it really is a journey of a marathon for each and every one of us. And just keep plugging forward if you can. Um, and with all of that, I will take questions and answers if anybody has anything that they do want to ask. Uh, you know, it's been a crazy journey. And if I can share anything else, I'd be more than happy to. Thank you so much, Roseanne, for sharing your story of perseverance of the beauty of the human spirit to overcome. So I don't know about everyone else, but I thought it was really touching, empowering, and just makes you think about life in different ways. And, and that's the thing. I mean, you know, as I said before that I get asked a lot of times, like, you know, uh, or people say to me, I would never be able to do what you did. And, you know, you just don't know until you're put in that circumstance. And um, it is crazy. And other people said, you know, would you, you know, how do you feel about the public speaking? And I think for me, like doing it is different. Um, it's been very therapeutic for me to tell the story over and over again. I mm -hmm. don't understand what truly happened to me. I mean, there are many mornings I wake up to, you know, cause I don't sleep with my leg on, you know, people do ask that, do you sleep with your leg on? And nope, I take it off every night. But when I wake up some mornings, I look down, I'm going, oh my God, I don't have a leg. Or I see my reflection walking past something and I'm like, oh, that's ugly. But, you know, and then there's other days I feel confident about it. So, um, you know, there's highs and lows through it all. And you just kind of have to accept those emotions and experience them. And then if you want to go back to a life, then you've got to figure out how to get there and get past it. And, um, you know, it's not easy. It, every day is a challenge. Um, you know, uh, I have funny moments where if I eat too much sodium the day before, the next day, sometimes, I, sometimes it's really difficult to get my leg on because your body swells with sodium and so doesn't my residual limb. So I know when I need to like make sure I drink more water or, um, you know, change my diet a little bit. Uh, 
And I do have to force myself to stay active because it's not as easy to, to do that. And, um, you know, there's just a different things. And the other thing I've learned is that you have to really advocate for yourself. Um, you know, this whole insurance is a whole nother thing. Um, you know, the, the insurance companies and in Medicaid and Medicare have been trying to get it to be like a one prosthetic for life, one and done. And I've had to, you know, go and speak in Washington on the fact that, you know, what do people do like little Jane Richard, who is, um, I think she was maybe five or six at the time and she lost her leg that day. Is she supposed to only have one prosthetic for her life? I mean, her body's gonna grow and change and, you know, how fair is that? Or your leg does change over the course of time, even as an adult and, you know, or your physical ability changes. And so does that mean that I should have a lesser prosthesis because now I can run, but I don't have the equipment to do so. Um, and they're so expensive, it's crazy. So there's just so many things that go into it that uh, it's just a different day every day and you just have to keep fighting unless, unless you don't want to. So, you know, but, um, okay. you know, and you have to rely on friends and family. Absolutely. Um, I don't know if others have questions. You can feel free to put something in the chat or to unmute and ask a question. I do see that Jan said, um, Hi, Roseanne, thank you for sharing your story and for giving us a positive way of thinking. Keep being amazing. Thanks, Jan, I appreciate it. And I miss you and Kenny. Hopefully we can see you guys soon. Mm -hmm. um, I do notice that there were quite a few of uh, friends and former coworkers on there. And I wanna say thank you to all of you for uh, coming on today and listening to my story. I, I know that a lot of times, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, background of things, but you know, uh, it's just uh, one of those things that we just never know what's gonna happen when we walk out that front door. So. Um, thank you, Diane, Monique, and Karen. I miss you guys. Hopefully we can do lunch soon or something, dinner, please. I think Julie has a question. So go ahead, Julie. Oh, Julie, go ahead. I'd love to ask, um, thank you again for sharing your story. In one of the pictures, did, did you um, show a picture of a service animal? And I was wondering if, if that was an accommodation, is that an accommodation that you have? Um, and if, if it is, can you tell us about it? Oh, that's a, that's a great, great question. So, um, you know, because of all of media and the press and our situation, uh, you know, we were offered a lot of opportunities and uh, one thing was offered was a service animal through the organization needs. Uh, they're an amazing organization. Their service dogs are incredible. And when you think of a service dog, they are truly a service dog. So, um, we could have uh, applied for one. And um, I did choose not to get one because I have a hard enough time getting myself together, let alone making sure I have dog food and poop bags and all of this stuff that goes along with them. Um, but we do have two dogs. So uh, I just uh, thought that, you know, if I needed to board a, my, our dogs, if we were going somewhere that I wouldn't, have the responsibility of always having to have the service dog with us or with me. Um, but uh, my friend Jessica, who sadly lost both of her legs in the bombing, uh, she did take needs up on it and did get the service dog. And her service dog's name is Rescue. He is absolutely amazing. She had to go through a two week process of living at the facility. And then they go through a graduation. And, legitimately, if she sneezes and says, oh, I need it, like if she goes a chew and he knows to go get her a tissue. If she does burr, he knows to go get her a blanket. She has another command for her cell phone. If she falls or she doesn't have her prosthesis and she needs them, he knows the command to go and get those. So um, they are truly amazing and they are top of the line. I know that there are other service type dogs out there, but um, you know, in, in our cases, I think you, know, you might need one that's a little bit more and maybe down the road, it might be something that I would consider uh, as I get older and maybe not as uh, you know, uh, able to get around as much or maybe not wearing a prosthesis any longer. But um, you know, 
because I'm sure as I get older at some point in time that it might become more difficult with it being 10 pounds on my, on my leg or whatever, but they are truly amazing. And uh, for those of you that ever consider getting one, I would, you know, if you really truly need one, I would definitely apply to different organizations. Well, I just learned a lot with the service dog. I didn't know how um, that they did that much and knew there was that kind of relationship. I figured it would be a close one, but not to that extent. So that's and there, cool. there are different levels of, of them, you know, in this one organization, doesn't just do it for that type of thing, but they have seeing eye dogs. Um, you know, they have, uh, there's other, you know, there's um, emotional dogs and there's all different kinds of levels of, of them, but this particular organization needs, uh, they're, they have them for all different situations, whether it's right. keeping someone calm uh, who might have, you know, anxiety issues or, uh, hearing issues, all of that, uh, mobility issues in general, it's, they're, they're truly amazing. And if anybody's ever had the opportunity, uh, they have their uh, facility out in Princeton, Mass, where at times you can volunteer or you can go and see the puppies and watch them being trained over the course of time. And they even have people that come in on the weekends or that take take the puppies for the weekend and work with them over the weekends at home. So, mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're just amazing. Cool. Um, does anyone have another question? I just want to be mindful of time, but if you have one more question, we'll take it. Love you, Carla. <laughs> um. And, you know, it's so funny because I was speaking to a group of, uh, I think there were eight year olds at, at, a, at a local school and they, I, I told them they could ask me any question. So they started with, what's your favorite food? What's your favorite restaurant? What's your favorite color? Um, and like, what kind of car do you drive? And then it got into, are you married? Do you have kids? How come you don't have kids? Uh, and you know, uh, the poor teacher was like mortified, but uh, you know, I do really enjoy speaking to all ages and answering any question that's out there. And um, no, we don't have children. I, I think that, uh, you know, it, it was one of those things that I have my three nieces and if it had happened, it had happened. And if it didn't, it didn't. And uh, my nieces are really kind of like my children. So, uh, you know, they have, they're so, so close with me, which I totally, truly appreciate. So, um, but yeah, there's, there's no question. So if anybody has anything or if there's someone in your life that you know that might have an issue or maybe going through an amputation, I'm more than happy to reach out to them or have them reach out to me, uh, email, cell phone, whatever you need. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for um, sharing your story if no one else has a comment. Um, I know that I was moved by your story. It's a story of perseverance, like I said. It's also, you know, a, a love story that, you know, in the end, you also found someone through this tragic um, event. I don't so, suggest anybody lose their leg trying to find <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't recommend that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is kind of the uh, silver lining in the situation. So, yeah. Yes, and it's beautiful that you're mentoring and supporting other women and other individuals that have been in the same situation, because I think only someone that's been in that situation can really relate and understand that what that means to go through that. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, you know, it's just an odd situation, but everybody has their story to tell. Everybody has a certain journey. And, uh, you know, all I can say is live your life as much as you can, because no tomorrow is guaranteed. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> if we didn't think that before, we certainly know that now. Yeah. Well, thank you again. I appreciate you sharing your story. It is being recorded. So for folks that don't know, we do have a Bristol YouTube channel and we put our stories that inspire series. So um, if you missed it or want to share it with someone, you can always go to our Bristol page. Uh, probably within a week, we'll have it up. And thank you again, and feel free to um, register for our next one in the chat. Our next Stories That Inspire will be April 29th with Bridget Arrows. So um, wishing everyone a great Thursday and all the best. Thank you again. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>